good afternoon everybody and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Improving K-12 Classrooms with Active Beams and Displacement Ventilation. Price Industries is a registered provider for AIA and our registration number is J877. Before we begin with today's presentation, I'd like to cover just a couple of administrative issues. The first is that your audio is broadcast through your computer and the quality of that audio will be dependent on your local internet connection. So if you run into difficulties, I do invite you to call in using a phone line and for your convenience we've included that phone number and access information on the bottom of every slide. Secondly, you may also submit questions at any time during today's presentation using the Q&A or question mark function or the chat function on your WebEx toolbar. If you do use chat, please make sure that you direct those questions to all panelists. We'll hold our responses to those questions until the conclusion of the presentation portion of the webinar. Finally, um, I would just like to mention that we are offering AIA credits for participation in the webinar and at the conclusion of today's event, everybody who has signed in will immediately receive an email uh, where you'll just have to enter your AIA license number so that we can provide that to you. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our presenters today. Kicking off the presentation will be Jerry Sipes who is the VP of Engineering at Price Industries. He has over 20 years of experience in the H HVAC field and uh, serves at a national level on ASHRAE, AHRI and USGBC. Jerry has been recognized for his research into human physiology and response to the environment. Our second presenter today is Julian Rimmer who is a senior product manager at Price Industry. Price Industries and oversees the development and application of sustainable technologies such as chilled beams, displacement ventilation, underfloor air distribution and radiant panels. Julian also serves at the national level on a number of different industry organizations um, and one of the, the key areas of interest he's involved in right now is developing an international design guide for chilled beams. Uh, as part of the REVA effort. Before we get into today's presentation, I just want to quickly uh, touch on the learning objectives for today. Uh, at the end of this presentation, you should understand how displacement ventilation and chilled beams work and how they differ from more traditional uh, conventional mixing ventilation systems. You'll learn about some of the challenges and opportunities presented when employing these strateg strategies in classrooms. And you'll also uh, have the opportunity to familiarize yourself with a number of different research studies and uh, the information they can provide us on the impact of comfort and indoor air quality on student learning. Finally, we'll, uh, we'll uh, give you the information that you need to identify opportunities for utilizing these technologies in your own designs. With that, I'd like to pass the presentation to Jerry Seitz. Thank you, Ange. So for this uh, topic that we're going to present today, it uh, will be outlined as follows. We'll give a brief overview of, of uh, some of the uh, reasons and the histories that we're considering these technologies for classrooms. And then I will give you a very brief uh, review of how displacement operates and again a brief review of active beams. And then Julian will take us through the process of putting these uh, technologies in the spaces. And then of course we'll have time for question and answer. So displacement is a uh, well-established technology, particularly in Europe. It's been used there for over 30 years. It's been in use in the United States for over 10 and a significant uh, amount. M majority of our uh, displacement ventilation products have gone into ed educational facilities. So this is actually well-established inside this uh, type of building structure and it will be uh, discuss in terms of the advantages and disadvantages that we may find here. Active beams also have a long history, uh, mostly in Europe, however. They've only been in the United States for well, maybe as much as 10 years, but really didn't receive much popularity until about the last five or so years. And they have a bright future in terms of use due to their energy savings characteristics and also their uh, potential for using 100% outside air. Now, 
two vehicles that oftentimes bring these two technologies to the forefront for design considerations include LEED and CHIPS. LEED for schools is a, uh, a program that basically addresses the unique characteristics of schools, in particular classroom acoustics. Classroom acoustics is a major reason uh, for considering displacement or actually chill beams. Either technology have a uh, much lower amount of ambient sound generation and they typically uh, will enhance the learning experience. We'll discuss some of the research that indicates uh, the potential for that enhancement. Now, of course, other things that we consider is mold protection, environmental assessments, uh, but also children's health, and actually, to some great extent, the uh, staff's health. When we talk about a, uh, a structure that has the potential for a lot of cold transmissions, flus, and such, schools are a prime example, being as most of the occupants have a uh, metabol uh, 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 immunization system that's being developed, so it's not complete. The anything I can do to drop the airborne risk of transmission is something we should consider. And in terms of credits for lead, energy efficiency is obviously on the forefront. Thermal comfort is actually a comfort, a credit that we oftentimes find easier to uh, achieve inside of displacement. And then there's the potential for personal control and also uh, for increased ventilation credits. Now the CHIPS program, Collaborative for High Performance Schools, although when I said CHIPS, some of you may have remembered Poncherello on the motorcycle for the California Highway Patrol thing. Um, this program is actually uh, growing in its uh, adoption. It's been adopted formally by 13 states. Um, there are four or five others that are either using a version of the CHIPS program or considering adoption. This impacts over 1.6 million students at this date uh, who attend a CHIPS-rated school. The goals of the CHIPS program are not unlike that of the Lead for Schools, um, to provide resources to help you as a designer. Um, they have a goal of increasing test scores. Um, this may be through either indoor air quality or through ambient sound reduction. They want to increase attendance and also increase the staff satisfaction. Another goal of theirs is to reduce the cost of operating these systems by 20 to 30 percent. Now, when you poll many respondents, both um, K through 12 and higher education, they all report that uh, energy considerations and uh, savings associated with that are one of the reasons that they've considered these green technologies for their own building types. So now we are going to go over the fundamental review of displacement ventilation. In its simplest form, when comparing against a traditional overhead mixing system, uh, displacement supplies warmer air. And this is around 65 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, uh, for schools, if you were doing an industrial site, you perhaps could use a lower temperature or even perhaps a warmer temperature. Displacement is characterized by very low velocities. In fact, I want the velocities in the room so low that there actually is no mixing effect from the supplier. And, and this is completely counter to overhead mixing systems, which of course by definition take your 55 or so degree air, inject it in the room through a diffuser, that in turn rolls the room and uniformly distributes the air. Now, in a displacement system, the heat loads drive all the air motion. We, uh, as occupants, output heat, roughly 100 watts each. If there is no air motion inside the space, our body's uh, natural plume will pull air from the floor to your head at around 30 feet per minute, in essence pumping the heat to the ceiling. This leads to stratified room temperatures. And interestingly enough, since most contaminants like, well, occupant, uh, respiration, coughing, sneezing, toners off of printers, um, and so forth, are all associated with the heating load those contaminants also find themselves distributed toward the ceiling. Another benefit of this uh, type of technology is that I'm not going to try to condition the space where I have no occupants. So I'm going to use the technology in its purest form to try to only condition the heat loads and, in essence, make the heat loads do most of the mixing work. This temperature stratification effect can be shown inside this image. Um, you have the diffuser. Traditionally, displacement is injected low. 
We allow it to uh, flow to the floor. In fact, displacement diffuser should have the air supplied fall to the floor within two feet of the diffuser face. So this, this means the face velocity on the diffuser is critical. It needs to be uniform in its velocity. Typically, for close occupancies like this, we're talking in the velocity region of 40 feet per minute. Now, in terms of human comfort, draft sensation uh, occurs at above 55 feet per minute or so, 50, 55, depending upon the person. So when we look at overhead systems, um, draft is probably the number one reason they complain about feeling discomfort. In terms of displacement, because the air velocities are so low, this is not a challenge, actually. We have little trouble making the indoor environment comfortable. Most uh, building spaces see a thermal satisfaction that's very high. I'm going to touch on this briefly in a moment. Now, there are some design considerations that I often review with uh, uh, building uh, designers. One is, how can I enhance the air quality? Can I enhance the thermal comfort through selection and placement? And what can I do to lower the acoustical signature? But at the same time we're considering there's the three, three design considerations, we're actually going to receive a benefit in terms of health in that uh, absenteeism has been shown to be decreased in displacement buildings. Uh, employee retention, teacher retention, is higher, and the student performance has been shown to be improved. Now we'll explore all those three technologies, or three benefits, I'm sorry, in just a moment. First, air quality. Now, displacement has been cited numerous times in that it removes the airborne contaminants much more efficiently than other technologies. One way of gauging this effectiveness is uh, using ASHRAE standard 62.1, the ventilation standard. And in it, they define ventilation effectiveness. The formula for it is over on the right-hand side. I like to describe ventilation effectiveness in a, a different way. I, I like to say, if you take a cubic foot of air in front of the breathing person, count the particles inside that, and then go to the return location, the return grill, count the same volume of air and count the particles. If the particle count is the same, that means the building is uniformly mixed and we have a ventilation effectiveness of 1.0 or 100% dispersal. If I look at displacement and do the same particle count in the breathing zone versus that of the return grill, you will find that at a minimum, displacement is 20% cleaner than the return air. And this is one indication that these contaminants are indeed building up at the higher levels inside the space. Now, there has been actually research that's shown displacement may be two or more times cleaner than the air inside the uh, mixing system, uh, but at an absolute minimum, you can guarantee that it'll be 20% cleaner as is outlined inside standard 62.1. And thermal comfort, I love this image because I have seen many many schools where sometimes people are wearing gloves, sometimes they're wearing coats, sometimes they're wearing short sleeves. And the difference in metabolism on children versus the adults is significant. I don't think that there's any reason that they have to dress warmer for these buildings. And in fact, with displacement, um, you don't see the same number of complaints. Overhead systems see around a 64 and a 65% satisfaction rating. If I were to pull 100 people, about 65 would say it's comfortable inside this room. If I did this on displacement, you would see that number be more like 90 to 95 percent, or 90 to 95 out of 100 would say this building is not cold, it is comfortable. Now, of course, I would love to be able to say that I can get 100 percent occupant satisfaction, but that's uh, probably not realistic. 95 percent is definitely a good number. Now, one other thing that you should understand about displacement is it does self-balance. So, if my occupant is my heat pump and it's moving air from your feet upward to the room, if I move around in the room, the air would need to go to that heat load. And in fact, that's what happens. Because the heat load is doing all the movement, the air spreads out, uniformly balances, whereas if I were to uh, do this with an overhead system, I might have um, not the same level of mixing. So th this is one way of saying there's a lower chance of overcooling. In terms of teacher retention, we had uh, several studies. One 
of which was from Buckley, Schneider, and Shang in 2004. And they looked at the following parameters of noise, lighting, off of the windows, air temperatures, and indoor air quality, and they found that the two factors that were most prominent were noise and indoor air quality in terms of dissatisfaction of the building space. So if you were able to re correct this, they indicated there would be at least a 5% increase in retention of staff in this building if you didn't, compared to if you did not change these parameters. Shaughnessy in 2006 looked at ventilation rates and the impact on standardized testing, and they found that uh, schools with higher ventilation rates, or more outside air, if you will, has a greater um, chance of having higher test scores. If I looked at Shield and Dockerel in 2003, they looked at noise in school performance, and they found that uh, if your ambient sound levels were, background sounds were less than 50 dBA, you had a 21% improvement in the scores for schools. Now, if I'm designing with displacement, I oftentimes can see a 35 to 40 dBA background sound or even less. So uh, I, I know for a fact that displacement will definitely improve the test scores of the students, if only because the background sound should be lower. So displacement ventilation benefits. Indoor air quality has been shown to be higher. It has been cited for increased thermal comfort. Again, 90-95% satisfaction rating compared to overhead systems at around 65. It's very quiet. There is the potential for reducing air volumes. Now, usually schools are a fairly densely populated space, but even so, I can usually reduce the air volumes by as much potentially as a quarter against that of an overhead mixing system. And I have, as a result, a reduced potential for amount of energy spent for fan horsepower and reheat. It is an excellent choice for retrofits. It fits a wide variety of building types, um, including the uh, sometimes difficult spaces like lecture halls, auditoriums, gymnasiums, and such. And if I start at the very beginning, I can integrate it in the architecture. In fact, I prefer to do that because then we're actually meeting both sets of requirements, the interior aesthetic as well as the mechanical performance. So that was a very brief <laughs> overview of displacement. So now I'm going to do an equally brief review of active beams. Beams are a uh, technology that's often referred to as an induction terminal. If I were to look at this beam on the right-hand side, I have a plenum on the top of the coil section that is taking your primary air, this air being the conditioned air, and potentially 100% outside air. If this uh, air is in this plenum, it has a pressure associated with it, usually around um, half an inch or so, maybe six tenths of an inch of static. This pressured air is driven through a row of nozzles on either side here, and this creates a high jet velocity. This high jet velocity in turn creates a low pressure center over the top of the coil, which in turn drags room air up through the coil and back out in the room. This drawing of the air through the coil transfers air, heat, or cooling effect uh, simply by the contact. Now, this induction ratio, if you will, of primary air against return air, uh, sorry, room air, is at least a one to two to potentially a one to six. So, one CFM of primary air may move as many as six CFM of room air. Now, energy efficiency, this comes from the fact that I don't have to remove as much air. Water is a very efficient system at removing energy in or out of a building simply due to its energy density. It takes less bright horsepower. Also, there's a potential for free cooling effect. If I am using a uh, system that requires less air, I can reduce my mechanical system size. Potentially, the interstitial space can be lowered as well because the air flow rate um, is a much lower volume. There is typically less re maintenance required for the system as there are no real moving parts or if, if potentially no drain pans inside the system. 
There is an improved thermal comfort associated with chilled beams and definitely an improvement in air quality um, because beams typically use more percentage of outside air. In effect, if we have a good chance of using 100% outside air inside these buildings, so it has the highest possible air quality associated with it. The thermal comfort comes from the fact that these, these mix so very effectively inside the room. Now, at the same time we're doing all of this, as long as my static pressures are not too high, no more than an inch of static, I typically have a very quiet mechanical system. Now, if I'm looking at the two types of heat transfer, air versus water, air systems are not going to be as efficient as a water air system, um, simply because air takes more brake horsepower to move any particular given amount of energy BTUs in and out of a building space. Now, if I can, I will design the air system to only put the ventilation air inside the building, minimizing to the absolute lowest level my brake horsepower requirements. Also, I want to design my air system to satisfy all latent requirements in the room. If I can do this, and if I put a control method in, say, a condensate sensor to prevent the coil from running below dew point, I can actually supply the zone with a chill beam that does not require a drain pan. This lowers your risk of mold and mildew issues. Also, uh, if I minimize the amount of outside air I'm putting inside the space, I lower my throw and my noise that oftentimes you can have issues with with overhead systems. Now, the water side system, I want to maximize the heat transfer to it. We call this transfer efficiency. In fact, you can be very, very efficient at moving the heat in and out of the building with a beam system because you put it directly to the air in the room. Um, you can easily satisfy the sensible cooling and the, and the heating load inside the space. And we do this actually with warmer water, um, somewhere around 56 to 65, maybe a typical nominal is 58 degrees. The whole goal, to minimize the risk of condensate formation, we want to uh, maintain the chill water supply in the zone at least two degrees above the dew point. This gives you a little bit of a pad against somebody opening a window or, or uh, cleaning the carpet. Now, uh, another thing that's a side benefit of this high induction ratio is I don't have to have 180 degree water to supply the reheat. I can use 120 to 140. And that goes hand in hand with the uh, lower energy source heating systems that oftentimes you consider inside lead. In my mind, beams are a great choice for classrooms, theaters and lecture halls, office and staff areas and such, laboratory spaces, any space that's humidity controlled, oh, and also retrofits because they can fit in lower spaces, and oftentimes in older buildings, we just don't have the space available to meet the current ventilation requirements and also provide the amount of air movement we need. In a displacement system, all of the above room spaces qualify, including spaces that are a little more challenging for beams like gymnasiums, restaurants and cafeterias due to the potential moisture uh, loads inside the air, and also industrial spaces such as uh, shops, uh, where we might have welding going on and we have the gas output of that. Displacement enhances that removal, whereas overhead mixing systems tend to disperse a little bit too much. If I'm doing a, a quick side-by-side, -side, well, a uh, displacement system, warmer air supply than that of a beam system. Um, but not unlike that of uh, the upper end on the chilled water supply on a beam. A displacement doesn't mix the space. Beam systems mix the entire space. Thermal plumes drive displacement. Beam systems are driven by ventilation air. Um, and as a net result, displacement uh, stratifies. Beams make it uniform and so forth. So this is the basic comparison of the two technologies. And we are now going to go to Julian, who will now take us through the application of displacement ventilation inside schools. So. Um as, as Jerry presented on uh, displacement ventilation, I wanted to talk a little bit about how this integrates specifically into classrooms. Jerry spoke to uh, the, the selection procedure in, in general terms, and the fact that we have 40-minute phase velocity is pretty typical out of a displacement diffuser. The end result of that is that we, we end up with diffusers that are significantly larger than you would have had with a, a typical system. And therefore, there's some important considerations that uh, we need to keep in mind when we are uh, selecting them and applying them in, in classrooms as well as other spaces. Most specifically, uh, from an aesthetic standpoint, 
the, the fact that these tend to be large-ish uh, diffusers that are usually mounted in the occupied zone means that there's going to be uh, some integration, um, which is fairly typical in, in most cases. And that could be integration into the wall, into some cabinets or, or millwork, as we'll see in, in a few minutes, and even into furniture. And it, it's not unusual for us to select special materials, special colors. And when I say, spe say special, I, I'm speaking more specifically to the fact that it's non-standard rather than something that's uh, necessarily expensive. So going through a, a few options for integration, um, I mentioned it could be wall-mounted or in the wall. The diffusers that you see at the top side of this slide, these are diffusers from the San Francisco Airport Terminal 2. These were actually designed specifically with the architectural team who had a certain aesthetic that they were uh, looking for, and then we took that back to our design team and developed a diffuser that would uh, satisfy that. So in, th in this case, it's a, a stainless steel perforated pattern that's got some interesting margins to, to create some effect. The bottom image is uh, integration of displacement diffusers actually into the base of the casework, which is located on the, uh, the perimeter wall of the classroom. Here we see a, a couple other options. Uh, the one on the right is a rounded diffuser, which is integrated into a column, which is uh, a fairly typical application. In this case, it's in a school library. And on the left-hand side, we have a, a floor-mounted displacement diffuser, which is uh, flexible in that it can be mounted along the perimeter, as you see here. This one actually has integrated heat, or it can be mounted, uh, you know, in the interior or in a curved type pattern. Basically, all the flexibility that you would have out of a floor grill, we can uh, turn it into a displacement. This is another example of a wall diffuser. This is on the same project. This is at uh, San Francisco Airport, and, and uh, we worked on this with the same architectural firm. One of the interesting elements of school design is that you have a significant number of disparate zones with different needs and, and different uses. You know, classrooms uh, are probably the, the most significant space um, in terms of, of design footprints as well as space use. But a gymnasium, uh, for example, has a totally different type of uh, occupancy and, uh, and use. So there are some significant differences when it comes to applying product for that. This is showing, this is actually a, a post-secondary classroom, but it, its application is uh, not a, atypical of a, a small auditorium or something like that for a K-12 school. Uh, you see some displacement diffusers in, in, built into the floor, and there's also some displacement diffusers built into the teaching wall to supply the front couple rows of, of students as well as the instructor. The classrooms are uh, typified by having fairly dense occupancy, as, as Jerry spoke of, and they, they definitely have uh, more stable loads than some of the other spaces um, in a school. And therefore, the, the selection of the diffusers ends up being quite straightforward. Uh, they're, it's not atypical to have two diffusers which are mounted on the hallway side of the room, which push out air out towards the perimeter. I spoke of a raised floor on the, the previous slide, but this is a more traditional application of a, a raised floor in, a, in an auditorium or lecture hall type space. Here you have diffusers mounted underneath the seats, and this could be every, every seat in this case, but that's actually unusual. Typically you'd have diffusers under every second or every, under every third seat. And this is basically taking advantage of the the slope that we have on the floor. We can pressurize the cavity underneath, minimize duct work, and make the diffusers um, sort of disappear into the background. We don't have diffusers at high level. Um, we are maximizing how much we're stratifying, which is also helping us to save energy. Here we see a, an image of a gymnasium. In this case, it's mounted on the floor in the corner. It's not unusual to mount these actually off the floor. Um, as you might expect, you know, there's all sorts of things flying around this space. It's a high impact space. And there's, uh, <clears throat> there's obviously a concern from, from damage. So uh, we've actually tested some of our diffusers for use in these type of zones and, uh, and come up with a solution that is, that is suitable for the environment. They tend to be large, but 
The, uh, the most integrated type of diffusers you might see in this type of space are located, say, behind the, the retractable seal, uh, seating, which is uh, pretty common in a classroom. Or uh, in this particular gym, you might locate it above or around that blue band uh, that goes through the center of the space. Other spaces, this is um, maybe a, a lesser applied type space, but if you have a locker room, this is basically just pointing out that all of the different zones in the, in the school are able to be applied with displacement ventilation. This particular one might be more high end than you would typically find in a K-12 school, but it, I think it is somewhat indicative of how you might apply displacement ventilation. In this particular case, it's built into the, um, these cubbies for a, this is actually for a professional sports team, but it could just as easily be a bank of lockers. And then we have uh, transient spaces. Uh, these are the, the common spaces, you know, the, the atria, the hallways, uh, the, the stairways, which are, uh, they do make up a significant portion of the footprint in the school. This particular one um, is in Iowa. And this one is a, an interesting case study because we have displacement diffusers that are built into the kick uh, plate below that, um, that nice wall on the right-hand side. But we also have um, chilled sails, so this actually has radiant cooling and heating along with displacement ventilation. These spaces uh, typically have um, a requirement to be a little bit more robust than others. You've got things that are wheeling through the space, so uh, talking about rigidity or integrating them into some of the architecture that, that helps protect them is definitely uh, worth some consideration. This is an example of displacement ventilation in, in a common space. In this particular instance, the diffusers are built into those stainless steel columns. So we actually have uh, worked with the design team who had a, a specific treatment that they wanted to cover the columns with, and we advised on what sort of free area was appropriate uh, to have a displacement diffuser built uh, into the column. And this can be done in two ways. Uh, it could either be designed to accommodate the the mesh or perforated uh, face which is being used on site, or if it's sufficiently free in area, we can go with a standard diffuser that's, that's simply painted black and hidden in behind the, uh, the architectural cover. This is clever use of displacement diffusers around uh, support columns. This uh, is a cafeteria space. This was actually two half-round diffusers that were installed, one on either side of the column to make a fully round outlet. And then on top of it, they put a, a tabletop or a countertop. So this particular case, you're getting multi, uh, multiple uses out of the diffuser. It's, it's both a, a spot to lean against and eat your lunch off of, as well as one to supply air into the zone. One thing to note on this particular image is that the students are actually quite close to the displacement diffusers. So this is indicative of the, the type of comfort that Jerry was speaking to earlier, and that even though we have supply air in the occupied space, the fact that it's low velocity and, and fairly high in temperature uh, does allow us to provide that air in a, in a comfortable manner. Probably the largest school in the U.S that has displacement ventilation is the Robert F. Kennedy School in LA. This is a very large school, it's 400,000 uh, square feet, and uh, has displacement throughout. And uh, you can't see it here, but the displacement diffusers are actually uh, integrated into the wall behind the camera, supplying air along the corridor, which is a pretty convenient place to locate it because then you can run your, your duct work through the corridor and have any sort of terminal devices uh, controlling airflow accessible uh, from the corridor and, and minimize how much duct work you're, you're using. And then the last case study in this section um, is the Borndale Elementary School. This is interesting in that it's got both displacement ventilation and active beams. And this particular image is showing active beams. They're running along the soffit on both sides of the suspended ceiling and they have a one-way discharge in this particular instance blowing towards the, the center of the ceiling uh, to avoid draft that uh, you might get if you were blowing it directly up against the soffit. So that um, transitions us into the 
active beams in school section. Displacement ventilation has a, a long history of use in schools. You know, we've um, seen it applied in fairly, pretty much every market in North America. It's been uh, used because of the air quality benefit, environmental quality benefit, basically, thermal comfort, air quality, and, and acoustics. And it was um, recommended by the CHIPS program, which gave it quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of interest in the, in the design community, the CHIPS uh, program, the Coalition for, for High Performance Schools, which started out of California, is now fairly widely adopted. Now, what we are seeing is a, um, a, a keen interest of applying active beams in schools as well, and this is driven primarily from the energy benefit that, that you get from displacement ventilation. And one, um, one school district in, in particular, the, the New York School Construction Authority, is actually um, looking to beams to be the basis of design for, for school construction uh, moving forward. So it is very, very quickly uh, gaining traction in the K-12 market. There are several types of beams uh, that are suitable for, for use in schools. One of them is a, a modular active beam, so this would be mounted in a suspended ceiling. It could also be uh, mounted independent of ceiling, but it's most typically in a lay-in ceiling. It's got a, a four-way discharge, and it's available in, in typical module sizes, 2x2, two 2x4, by 2x6, two, two by uh, two by and 4x4, four four. so there's a lot of flexibility in, in how it's applied. And there's also a lot of flexibility in, in how it's constructed, you know, tweaking the, the face design to be uh, appropriate for a certain type of, of feel in the classroom. Another type of beam which is um, a little bit more easily integrated into architecture is uh, a beam that actually fits into soffits. You can't see it in the image, but the return section that, that Jerry was speaking of, the, the section that draws there from the room, is actually in behind that bar grill that runs from column to column. The discharge from the beam is in that slot diffuser. So this is a slot diffuser with a mud in frame, uh, which basically makes the, the mechanical system disappear into basically uh, just a, a slot or linear edge. You can <coughs> see how the, the beam does hide quite nicely into the, uh, into the soffit in this particular instance. But the flexibility exists for basically the entire beam line. You know, if they're exposed, you might integrate them with wings, which help maintain a nice horizontal pattern. There are several options for exposed casings and, and integrating with the other mechanical services. It's not unusual to put the controls in the beam. So all you see from the room, for example, would be a continuous linear beam. You know, this beam, this particular beam doesn't, but it could just as easily integrate the return any additional supply, the controls, so that from the room all you see is what looks like a, a linear consistent beam, but from a mechanical standpoint it's actually sort of a multi-functional type device. This also is excellent for maintenance because you don't need to have access doors, say in a hard ceiling, you can simply open the face of the beam which is hinged and, uh, and access all the control elements from there. Show a couple uh, case studies of beams. This is the Ogden High School. This is um, in Utah, and this particular school uh, was a renovation. This is a historic building, and they put a um, a new common area which joined one building to another. And you can see along the glazing on the left hand side, right at the top, is the two way beams, and there's also beams installed in between the the clouds and the ceiling, uh, which are providing cooling to the space. And uh, our understanding from speaking with the, the school district in this particular instance is that it's, it's more than successful. It creates a very quiet, comfortable environment for the, the students, and they're, they're very excited to, uh, to be using it. So one technology which has uh, recently developed is an integration of the two. So we talked a lot about the benefits of displacement ventilation, where you know, it provides a very comfortable environment, maximizes air quality, and is, is very quiet. The energy savings with displacement ventilation are significant, uh, but perhaps not as significant as some of the opportunities afforded by beams. 
And an intelligent application of, of the two technologies together can leverage the benefits of one technology to maximize that of the other. So when we look at the energy savings, for example, we're using a water system, which allows us to uh, economize by using pumps rather than fans to move energy through the building. But the displacement ventilation system allows us to reduce the ventilation rate. So this minimizes how much air we need to bring into the building, which we are conditioning, right? We're dehumidifying, we're wringing moisture out, which takes up a lot of energy. And we're also using thermal stratification in this space. So it's going to be cooler where the people are than it is at high level. One of the benefits of using a dedicated outdoor air system, which we have from the beam technology, is that that warm air that's trapped at high level can simply be exhausted. So the heat that we would have had to cool with a, a typical uh, mechanical system can now simply be ejected from the building. So that actually reduces how much cooling we need to do in the building itself, which is probably the most exciting uh, benefit from using this type of, uh, of hybrid solution. So it works by using a beam basically on its side. We have an active beam, so we still have primary air that's supplied to it. So this would be the ventilation air, or the air that we need to do or supply for dehumidification. That um, uses nozzles, as Jerry was describing earlier, to induce room air through the face, which is the top section of the beam, where it's then conditioned and supplied out the bottom section of the beam in a displacement type manner. So this is warm enough to not cause discomfort, uh, but still cool enough to provide cooling if you're in cooling mode, uh, but also is low, sufficiently low velocity to have um, the indoor air quality benefits by minimizing mixing and the thermal comfort benefits uh, from reducing draft. The device typically has uh, piping and headers running in behind it, so some of the imagery you might see uh, makes accommodation for that. So now if we compare it to the, uh, the comparison that Jerry showed in the previous section, uh, we have similar supply air conditions as we had with the, uh, the ceiling mounted beams. We have sufficiently cool air in order to provide dehumidification, but the supply air directly into the zone is more similar to that of a displacement ventilation system. We're not mixing the space at all, but we're going down to basically a dedicated outdoor air system, so we don't have uh, basically a, a return path uh, for the air. You might still elect to do energy recovery uh, in order to, to maximize the use of the energy that you've used to cool air in the first place, but uh, you don't necessarily need to return that back to the zone if you're uh, in a market that, that wouldn't require, require it. The temperature, as I mentioned, is stratified, which is what helps us leverage uh, the benefits of displacement ventilation to, uh, to maximize the, the energy situation in the space. The device is heavy duty, it's got a, a very strong face, and whether it's perforated or louvered, either way it's, uh, it's very rigid and can withstand the, the rigors of a, a classroom environment. And this would typically be mounted on the perimeter wall in a classroom, perhaps underneath windows, and you might not need to use that entire wall, which might be you know, 30 feet long. So what you could do uh, in the spaces between the required diffusers is have a similarly designed bookshelf which could um, make up uh, the space between one to another or have a, a valve access section for the maintenance crew. Now, of course, we can do custom faces and, and colors as, as might be appropriate for a particular application as we can with uh, our other technologies. So here you, you see an example of how it might be located. Um, along the, the perimeter. And this is an example of a, an enclosure that was built uh, around a device like this to, uh, in order to uh, make it suit the, the aesthetic of the classroom a little bit more closely. So, Just in, in summary of the benefits of this particular technology, the beams provide an efficient alternative to traditional HVAC systems, and this is largely from using the benefits of both technology to complement each other. 
So the locating the beams at low level allow us to supply air in a displacement type manner. This, this leads to improved air quality. It also offers energy savings from reducing the, the amount of cooling we need to do, as I spoke to earlier, uh, which also can help save on, uh, on capital equipment costs by reducing how much uh, chiller tonnage we have. One really exciting project that we're working on the moment is the Green Schoolhouse series, which is in uh, this particular school that we're working on now is in Phoenix. And we're a flagship partner of, uh, of this particular effort. And what it is, it's, it's basically a, uh, a nonprofit that is building green schools in, uh, in areas that, that are uh, typically in, in need of community centers and uh, you know, particularly worn down uh, school districts. So it's, it's all done by contributions and is actually built in a, similar, in a manner that's not dissimilar to Habitat for Humanity, where you actually have volunteers help build the school. And we're very excited to be uh, part of this particular uh, project in, in Arizona. In this particular school, we're using both displacement ventilation and active beams uh, with a dedicated outdoor air system. So it's, a, it's an excellent uh, case study for, for this type of technology. So uh, in, for follow-up, there's a lot of opportunity um, on our website for learning more about these technologies. Just as we're doing this webinar today, we do have engineering webinars or uh, more technical webinars on both displacement ventilation and beams. So you can, you can see those on the website. We've also done some on natural ventilation, which is uh, another technology that's definitely appropriate for, for K-12 school construction. So uh, if further information is required, um, it is definitely available on, on the web. So with that, I'll, I'll transition back over to, to Angeline. Thank you very much, uh, Julian and Jerry, for your presentation today. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and open up the floor for questions and answers. Uh, you can utilize the Q&A or the chat functions on your WebEx toolbar to submit your questions. If you do use the chat function, please make sure to submit those questions to all panelists. And uh, I'd just like to apologize for the unexpected construction noise in the background there. So we've already received several questions, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Julian, are there geographic regions where you see more chilled beams or displacement? I, I, yes, the, the West Coast is certainly an area where economizer use is, is more prevalent. It's not as humid outside, and the temperatures are, are more similar to what you might require as of a displacement ventilation system. So I think we've seen a lot more use of displacement technology on the West Coast because of that. But I don't think it's limited in any way by climate. Uh, certainly it maximizes the, the benefit from economizer, but the, the benefits you get from displacement ventilation from a perspective of thermal comfort and uh, you know, student performance, teacher retention, all the stuff that Jerry was talking about is independent of climate, of course. And so we've seen some of the most successful installations of displacement ventilation in you know, Massachusetts and Michigan and, in, and even in the southeast. So I think it, both technologies are definitely applicable in, in all climates, although you might maximize some of the benefits in, in one climate when compared to the next. Thank you, Julian. Jerry. Are there maintenance aspects of these technologies that are different than conventional mixing systems? Uh, in terms of maintenance, all, all air systems should have filtration. So just like the uh, overhead mixing systems at your air handler, you should filter the air going to the zone. In terms of maintenance at the room side, they're very similar in characteristics. So um, the only, only issue you might have is if you were um, putting a chilled beam in an area like uh, a hospital with a lot of lint generation, you might have to clean the lint off the face every six months. But other than that, I, I don't see any difference in maintenance between the two technologies and overhead mixing. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Julian, 
Is there a cost premium on these technologies, and what kind of ROI are we looking at in the long term? Uh, that, that's an excellent question. I, I think it depends on the basis of construction in a particular market. I think schools in particular um, have, have been plagued in the past by, by tightening budgets and, and maybe have been designed to be you know, fairly low cost type institutions. It's not uncommon to see a school with you know, simple DX package rooftop units um, but we're seeing, I think, a significant trend in, um, in improving the quality of, of school construction. Some of the schools that we've seen recently have been you know, some of the, the nicest buildings that, that, uh, that we've been able to be part of. So I think that's an exciting trend. Now, I, speaking specifically to the mechanical system, I mean, these would be typically more expensive than a packaged DX rooftop system, but if you're looking at, say, a, an air handler system with a, a chiller plant, then I think that the cost would be quite comparable to, uh, to a, a typical mixing system. You get benefit from reduced ductwork, smaller equipment, um, but you do have more expensive outlets in the case of beams. With displacement ventilation, uh, you, you might have you know, less cooling requirements, slightly smaller air handlers. The diffusers are a little bit larger, but um, I think overall they, they tend to be uh, cost neutral to a, a very slight premium. The benefit uh, return from that, though, is, is significant. You know, in, in teacher retention alone, that means uh, cost savings from not having to, to seek out new teachers and, and train them and develop them. You know, from a school standpoint, reduced absenteeism. It's hard to really put a value on uh, on improved test scores or or improved wellness, but uh, that's certainly something that the school board and parents would would care about. And uh, on the energy side, both of these technologies afford significant energy savings. So if, you know, as we see energy costs rise, I think that um, you're just going to see a, a greater and greater return on your investment. Thank you, Julian. Jerry, at what stage of design do these technologies need to be considered? I think that all successful projects, particularly when you're doing something that's either new to the design engineer or the end user or perhaps the architect, is at the beginning. If you're going to consider these technologies, the entire team needs to be on board. And if you can get the contractor on board too, then you're going to have a lot easier path to uh, reaching the final design. And I've seen that uh, we've been involved in the very beginning, and, and those jobs, from my perspective, tend to go a little smoother because uh, we bring all different aspects to the table at the same time. So I would suggest you do it as early as possible. Thank you, Jerry. Julian, can you tell us how we'd go about providing heat with displacement ventilation? Um. Heat from displacement ventilation can be uh, provided in a, in a couple of, of different ways. Speaking specifically to a classroom, because you would normally have diffusers mounted on the inside corridor, whereas heat is typically required on the glazing, uh, usually you would use fin tube radiation in a cold climate. Uh, you could use ceiling-based uh, radiant heating. Uh, you could also um, integrate the displacement diffuser into the heat. We've done a few projects where we've actually built a, a, an enclosure around a displacement diffuser that integrated the perimeter heat. So in that particular instance, not unlike the hybrid solution we spoke of, you could have uh, heat in the top section of the diffuser while you continue to provide ventilation air below. In the case of beams, uh, you can do heating and cooling uh, with no issue. It would be similar to a mixing system. In the case of the hybrid, uh, the coil that we would be using for cooling could simply be used for, for heat. And we've seen that even, even providing air in heating mode, you could uh, increase the velocity slightly out uh, the bottom of the diffuser to uh, improve mixing or encourage mixing or push the warm air further into the zone. So in all three instances, there's fairly or very effective and uh, low-cost means of, of providing the heat. Thank you, Julian. 
Jerry, can you tell us which solution is quieter and why? Compared to overhead systems, um, displacement is most likely around 10 NC or so quieter, typically. Um, the diffusers are very, very quiet systems. Um, and since they're designed for low phase velocities, that's one of the reasons that we have this lower sound generation. Static pressure and, and sound generation are basically a one-to-one. -one. If you're looking at the chilled beam technologies against uh, overhead mixing, chilled beams, again, are also quieter um, because, first off, we have less air going to the system. And we're typically running the static pressures on the inlet to the plenum at the same level or even lower, most likely, than that of the overhead system. So, again, less potential for sound generation. And if we're looking at both technologies, um, displacement is slightly quieter than chilled beams, but not so appreciably that you'd find that you need to rule one out over the other. Thank you, Jerry. Julian, could you please tell us what the face velocity from the full mounted chilled beams is? It'll range based on the amount of air that's being supplied into the beam. Uh, you would typically target as low as possible, but due to space constraints, you probably will have to compromise slightly on that from what you would have uh, done with a displacement ventilation system or a pure displacement ventilation system. So you would typically have velocities in between 30 feet per minute and maybe getting as high as uh, 70 or 80. So um, it, it's going to depend on occupancy, it's going to depend on load, and it is a very, very slight increase in cost, if, if no cost impact at all, to add demand control ventilation to that equipment, because you already have the thermostat, uh, you already have the equipment, all you need is a, a damper on the fresh air inlet. So uh, being able to tune the supply air and thereby tune the discharge uh, air velocity based on occupancy is uh, is an excellent advantage to that particular product. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and send them in now. We have uh, one more question to address before we conclude, but if you do get another another question in today and we don't have a chance to respond, we'll go ahead and follow up with you after the event. Uh, so the last question is for Jerry. Jerry, when installing chilled beams in an, ex in, a, in an existing building that has poor construction, what are some ways to monitor and control humidity in the space? Uh, historical buildings um, typically all had poor construction compared to what we have in today's climate. We had air infiltration rates of up to 25 times the uh, volume of air in the building. And so when we're looking at an existing building we're renovating, the older the building is, the more you must pay attention to this, this uh, infiltration. And, and what I normally like to do is, is uh, monitor the humidity in the zone, particularly on the windward side of the building with either relative humidity sensors um, and or dew point sensors, and definitely want to have some sort of pressure control in an effort to maintain control over where the air is going. If we can at all times. We'd like to install a vapor barrier of some sort on the outside, but oftentimes that's not possible. So we just pay more attention to the control system and uh, potentially the pressurization of the building to do this control. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, just one final question I'm going to squeeze in here before we conclude. Can displacement be used in industrial applications where high air change rates are required or with industrial exhaust systems? You want me to answer that one? Okay. Um, yes. And in fact, historically, uh, displacement was started in, in Europe in most industrial centers. The um, higher air exchange rates in some ways are required because of the, the mixing effect that we get from overhead systems. If you, if you go to displacement, you can actually enhance the contaminant removal. So maybe one thing we could do is look at if you really still need those high exchange rates with uh, displacement compared to overhead mixing. But the industrial center has a benefit in that usually we don't mind a little draft, so I can increase the air velocity out of the diffuser. This is another way of controlling where the contaminants go. So I, I don't see that as an issue with industrial centers at all. In fact, it's underutilized. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Julie and Jerry, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation today. Um, those that participated and signed into today's webinar will receive an AIA credit. We're going to send you a uh, link to a brief form after the, uh, after the event concludes so that you can provide us with your AIA number so that we can appropriate, appropriately uh, apply that credit to you. If you have any questions or concerns, please go ahead and contact me. My name is Angeline Burks and you can see my email address there on the screen. We'll also shoot you an email uh, next week sometime with a link to a recording of today's event. I'd like to thank you for participating in today's webinar and that concludes this session. Thank you very much and goodbye.